It was Jesus himself who said, If you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You can say a hearty, smiling, energetic, amen out there. I'll take it like that. I make to you four promises. <laughs> Promise number one is the Bible is going to be the bedrock of our study. And the reason is the Bible means what it says and says just what it means. Promise number two, you are going to be enlightened irrespective of who you are. Promise number three, you are going to be challenged to make the most important decision of your life. And promise number four, your life and mine will never be the same. Our theme for this entire week, hope for families, build, establish, and flourish. Build, establish, and flourish. Our subject yesterday was unfamiliar, family frenemies. We've dealt with the issue of ignorance. So this evening, I want to invite you to a year-long masterclass. It's a masterclass for one year. If you are a married couple, we call it Love Connect. It is for married couples. And if you are single, it is called Not Yet Tied. Tomorrow I'm going to spend time to break it down. You may part away with $400 for a year for that masterclass. For married couples, it is a $500. And knowledge is not cheap. If you indeed want to add value, it's a year long, including deep inside workbooks. So I want to invite as many. I'm going to repeat it until i am done so just book it up we're going to talk about it a little more tomorrow our subject for today faulty family foundations our subheading whom shall i marry this coming saturday we are going to have baptisms i mean baptism by tomorrow tonight tomorrow friday and Saturday, many families are going to see their positioning before God and will call for baptism. Some may call for re-baptism because the life which we have lived is not one of Christians. So watch out for that. Tonight, I'm going to make an altar call for the first time for those who want to commit their life to God through baptism. Those online, you are actively involve as well so watch out for say whom shall i marry family or faulty family foundations whom shall i marry how many persons here are not currently married but will wish to marry one day let me see your hand all right how many persons watching online are presently not married and will desire that one day they are married. Please, tie currently single. Currently single. We are going to have a long night. I would need not less than one hour, 30 minutes. So bear with me. Our scripture texts are quite much. But the one we just read, I will get back to it. The Bible says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. This was the end of creation. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. And obtains favor from the Lord. This evening, 
I have three basic objectives for this presentation. Objective number one is to provoke us to rethink and analyze our misguided concept about dating, courting, and or courtship and marriage while we instead welcome and follow God's impeccable ideal on the subject matter. Objective number two is to unequivocally present some practical qualities to seek in a prospective spouse. If you want to marry, what must you look out for? Objective number three is to ignite a passionate discussion around the concept that is the quest to be in a relationship without a clear destination is the highest form of mediocrity and arguably a denial of faith. I am dating. Where are you headed? You don't know. When do you want to marry? I don't know. Everything you don't know. Today, my language is better. I'm baptized. So, that is not right. I dedicate this presentation to my daughter. Susan is growing. Susan is going to be 12 years this year. And this evening or this morning, as I was contemplating and preparing, one day Susan will see this presentation. It is my passionate, everything I'm sharing here, I wish my daughter will follow it. I also dedicate it to uh, Emma. Uh, watch out for the Susan used to be very small, and I used to carry her. When she was born, very tiny, she brought so much joy into our lives. But now she's getting to 12 plus 10, 22. My heart is just... Because the guys are bad these days. You know, guys can be quite something. So I dedicate this presentation to Susan. Allow me to say, I'll begin to speak like a gentleman before I start to speak like a street guy. So, just allow me. It's good to be single. I want to make that point very clear. Today, when young people are not married, they are in their 30s and 25, then there is pressure. Why are you not married? Sometimes, even when women or young ladies are not yet married we just want them to get somebody and just get married no that is not wise i want to state that it is good to be single marriage sometimes is over high and sometimes it is presented with a rose tinted perspective while well, singleness is demeaned and belittled as if it is lonely, it is boring, it is unpleasant, it is distressing. No, that is not right. Take your Bibles. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. Mark it down, I will get back to it. Being single simply today, at some stage, people even see it as if you are cursed or you are failed. Why a young, beautiful lady, a young man at your age, why are you not married? Like seriously, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 8, it is good for a man to be single. In this case, an unmarried person, it is good to stay unmarried. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says being single is not bad. Let me say it again. The Apostle Paul, calls singleness a gift and jesus endorses singleness in its context as good for those it was given example first corinthians chapter 7 verse 7 for i wish that all men were even as i am myself but each one has his own gift from god one is this manner another is that paul is saying I am excited that I am single. And he says, I wish all men were single. But everyone has a gift. In other words, 
being single is a gift. May I declare today, not everyone is meant to marry. Jesus said so. Matthew chapter 19, verse 11. But he said to them, all cannot accept the saying, but only those to whom it has been given. Let me explain. Singleness from a biblical perspective. I have a very long night with you today. Number one, it's good to be single. I repeat, and I'm giving you the corresponding Bible verses. It is good to be single. Singlehood and the Bible. Number two, it's a gift to be single. I've given you the corresponding Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2 to 9. The Bible and singleness. It's a blessing to be single. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25 to verse 31. Who is saying singleness is a cry? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32 to verse 33. It is freedom to be single. There are categories of singlehood. In the Bible. Uh, if you read the book of Matthew chapter 19 verse 12. For there are Enoch's who were born that way. And there are Enoch's who have been made Enoch's by others. And there are those who chose to live like Enoch's for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept these shall accept it. Three categories of singles. One, some are born to be single. Two, some are made single. Three, some chose to be single. Ladies and gentlemen, stop giving needless pressure to the young ladies, to the young men to be married. It's good to raise a genuine concern at a certain stage, but sometimes some even don't want to come to church because everybody who meets them is asking them, have we gotten somebody? Every, when the year is ending, our daughters are under pressure. Our girls are under pressure. Ladies and gentlemen, singleness is not a cry. If that is clear, somebody scream and say an amen. Hey, it's like they're angry. It's your problem. I repeat, scream and say an amen. The mothers are not happy with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> they want their grandkids. <laughs> what is this man up to today? <laughs> you brought her here to come and tell our girls remain single? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you is married. See the way you are struggling. <laughs> Those who are married are tired of marriage, yet they are forcing their daughters and their sons to be married. <laughs> you, you are tired. <laughs> and you want somebody to enter into the, the problem you have found yourself in. What level of wickedness is this? <laughs> Allow the sisters, man. So what are the benefits of being single? One, singlehood offers you the period to discover and develop yourself. Is a time to groom and to grow. That is one of the ladies in our team, Deborah. She is single, beautiful lady. And I told her, don't be under any pressure. Take your time until you find a beautiful, decent man. Benefit of being single. This is one of our team members. All the online works we do is called Joshua Single. You are safe from the demands of marriage and family life. It's a benefit of being single. Decent guy, clean lady, single. They will be married one day. But at this stage, I keep telling them, discover yourself, develop yourself, groom yourself, be growing yourself. Don't be waiting. Dear Lord, I need a husband. Dear Lord, I need a husband. Dear, the whole world is at the heart. Why? You need a husband. Keep living, keep working, keep discovering yourself, keep traveling, keep... Listen, don't stop lying because you need a husband or a wife. 
If that is clear, let the singles in the house say a loud amen. Right? The demand on family life is crazy. When I'm developing my slide, my daughter can come and look at me and say, Daddy, I also need time for counseling. And I know that is not her. A demon is speaking through her in the bedroom. It is the mother. <laughs> you know the way Satan spoke through the snake. <laughs> so Samuela is speaking through Susan. The demand of family life. Sometimes I wish I was single. You know when you are single, you can just go and get some food at the roadside. So you, 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 you know, it's a simple lie. But this one, if you are traveling, you need to call. Hi, I am I am on the way. <laughs> when you arrive, I have arrived. You make a video call. This is where I'm staying. I am alone. <laughs> it's like you're a prisoner. <laughs> it's not simple to be married. You know. The guys, the guys in Kenya, their marriage is 100%. Me, I'm from West Africa. So, it's okay. What's the third benefit of being single? A special season to pursue your dreams and aspirations. Being single. Soon you will notice. You want to go to that, that place. And then a woman says no. Or a man is saying no. While single, please pursue your dreams and aspirations. Benefit number four of being single. The season of singlehood is a special season. Okay, to pursue your dreams. Number four. Singlehood affords you a privilege to be more focused. You are not so much distracted. Wife, husband, children, expectation of society, blah, 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 everywhere. No, you can be focused. Check the data. Either be it in science or in the art or in music or in sports. Singles excel much more than the marriage. You have enough time. If it is work, you work yourself to sleep. You write more sermons. You develop more content. You are more spiritual. You are in the spirit every day. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. But when you are married, it can bring the Holy Spirit down. <laughs> Being single, number six benefit is potential of making a more mature decision in a choice of life partner chances are that sometime some woman i married when i was 26 some married when they were 25 it is possible you listen to my word it's possible that the more matured individuals get the more mature decision they make or some of them can become and then they make they settle for anything, including a lizard in a brown suit. Because they are desperate to be married. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the benefit of being single? You have a healthier social life. It's contestable. But, ladies and gentlemen, being single is not a crime. So to Josue, who represent the singles from West Africa, and Deborah, this is your season. Now I want to touch briefly. These are all introduction. If I'm not done, I'll go in tomorrow. I want to share with you 10 or 11 signs that shows you may be ready for marriage. It's part of my introduction. All these are introduction. Number one, what shows that you are ready for marriage? Quick 10 point. Number one, your God concept and relationship with him must be sorted at the time you want to get married. Don't marry before you know God for yourself personally. I repeat, don't marry before you know God for yourself personally. Jeremiah says, that says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. 
but let him who glories glories in this that he understands and knows me before you get married know god know the god concept have a relationship with god i'm saying two things it's one is a knowledge and one is also an experience They're all put together in other words your values and belief system must be sorted before you are married don't make the mistake point number two is part of my introduction self must be discovered before you marry if you have not discovered yourself you are not qualified to marry and i'm going to prove to you from scripture it's a sin not to discover yourself and you are married chances are that on what basis are you marrying a partner know your strength know your weaknesses know your personalities do these before you marry includes knowing your purpose knowing your potential knowing your heritage knowing your destiny ladies and gentlemen if self is not discovered don't marry so those of you asking the young ladies marry the young men marry marry ask yourself have they discovered god number two have they discovered themselves or because they are at a certain age they need to marry the reason is they must make babies it's the lowest form of thinking concerning marriage fact number three marriage concept must be understood and tonight i'm going to give you some more and you need to join the master class and pay and learn some of them as a full year course you go for an mba program you go for a phd program you go for first degree and you went to learn an english weather and you get a certificate and you are proud i am a graduate you went to learn about england their weather and you paid money you pay 500 dollars and know about marriage and master marriage be confident you know what you are doing a decision that will change your life then he said that it is too much no it is not too much knowledge is not cheap understanding is not cheap you need to understand the concept of marriage point number four you must have dealt with pasts your past you must have dealt with them it includes childhood abuses you must have dealt with them don't go seeking for someone's daughter with your baggage some of us we are damaged we go to marry with our damaged personalities and we damage someone else's or someone else's daughter no before you are married you should be able to have dealt with your past including your child good abuses and self-esteem issues point number five before you are married how do you know i'm ready to be married you must be content with your singlehood state if you are very dissatisfied with your single who stayed, trust me, you'll be dissatisfied with marriage. You know the reason why? Your husband will not make you happy. I'm sorry. Your wife will not make you happy. You are going to discover a way to be happy within that relationship. Don't put the burden of your happiness on any man or any woman. So in your singlehood state, you must be content. You are living before you marry. Don't feel you are inadequate. No, it's a bad mindset. No. Adam never knew he was. Point number six. Be emotionally intelligent. Your emotional intelligence must be sorted. So emotionally, you must be intelligent. You know when to key in this and when to key out that. Point number seven, for the sake of time, the courtship decision must be owned. In other words, whoever you think you want to date, or you must tell yourself, I am ready to be married. I am ready to date. Don't do it because parents are asking you to do it. They won't stay in the marriage with you. When we are done, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his... When we are done with the benediction for the next 40 years, it is your trouble, O oh God. It is your trouble. You will carry it alone. Madam, don't be under any pressure. So, must you marry him? Must you marry her? Own the decision. And I'm referring to Genesis chapter 24 from verse 50 to verse 57. Before Rebecca was married to Isaac, we're going to study today, they asked her, do you want to go with this man? She said, yes, I will go. She owned the courtship. 
of the marriage decision. Own it. Number eight, how do you know you are ready? You must have moved on with past relationship. The man who disverted you, the young man, you, you know this whole nonsense. Move on, my brother, my sister. Please. You are not the first person to be disverging. You have seen. God has forgiven you. Move on. Don't carry it like it is a sack on your head. Please. Move on. Forgive yourself and move on with past relationship. When you see your ex-boyfriend, don't be having palpitations. No. If you need deliverance, come. We'll deliver you. So that you are free from this burden. Number nine. How do you know you must, you may be ready for marriage. Be gainfully employed. Especially for the men. Why is the room silent? This is 80% for the men. If you're not working, don't marry. Marriage is not suicide. Please. I'm going to prove it in scripture. At least. Okay, I will leave it. Number 10. Demystify temperament and love languages. So what is your temperament? What is her temperament? You see, some of these basic things, you don't know them. The whole thing will be a messy. Ladies and gentlemen, number 11. I think I'll end here and go to the main seven. These are all introduction. Count the cost. The cost might or should have been counted. What am I entering into? Am I committed? Am I ready to pay the cost? Jesus said, who builds the house? Will not sit down and count the cost. Listen, you cry. You cry. I recall someone when we were married. And then, uh, even when you cough, then she's crying. What is this? She's watching. Samola, you know. You, even when I cough, she's crying. So Susan, when she was born, even when you sneeze, my daughter is crying. I said, you see what you have done? You were crying too much. Even when I'm going to preach all night, she'll be in the house. Then she's crying. I'm in love with this Ghanaian guy. I would die without him tonight. You know, and 14 years, she still sometimes cry. It means I know how to do many things. You understand the point? It's, 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 for 14 years, to still give your wife palpitation, you, you need, I know, true wisdom a house is built, by understanding, by knowledge, the rooms are filled. You know, so count the costs. Faulty family foundations. Many marriages begin on the wrong note. We want to deal with those faulty foundations. This is part one. We have up to part five. Tonight we're going on a long haul. Number one. I said it yesterday. Marriage is God's intention and invention. We dealt with it yesterday. Then, point number two. Marriage is not just God's intention and God's invention. Yesterday we all agreed. That when you look at the marital uh, concept and framework, marriage is a covenant. Yesterday we saw it. The wife of your marriage covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Please, singles, please, those who want to marry again, it is a covenant. Number two, marriage is intimate. Or it calls for intimacy. The Bible says, it says, and they both shall be one flesh. It includes sex, but it's more than that. The one flesh involves more than I'm going to break it down as we go. Marriage is not just intimate. Marriage is lifelong. So before you enter marriage, it's not like doing boyfriend, girlfriend. When I don't like it, I move out. When I like it, I stay. No, it is lifelong. Because the Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Don't go and see a young lady and you are just having palpitation at the face of your life and you are going to sign your death warrant for the next 60 years it's lifelong count the cost you will sleep with one woman for the remainder of your life anything aside that is possibility for you to lose your eternal life you will stay with one man for the rest of your life ladies and gentlemen marriage is lifelong it's a divine union it's a divine union yesterday we looked at that the question I want to answer this evening is also, what is the purpose of marriage? Many marry without the purpose. Let me dare you. What is the purpose of marriage? Answer it for yourself. 
The first answer that will come to your mind, procreation, companionship. Really? Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. If you do not sort out those issues, you don't even know who is the right person to marry. Because the whole marital concept is so hasty and fussy in your mind. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper, comparable to him, suitable for him. In other words, I want to say, the purpose of marriage is to mutually complement one another. Mutually. Look at it again. I will make him a helper. Comparable. Some persons will say suitable. Listen, your husband may not be suitable for my wife. My wife may not be suitable for your husband. He may be good for you, but you may not be good for him. Listen, God made for Adam a wife or a spouse comparable, suitable to him. In other words, when you take that woman, she can't fit anywhere except in the life of Adam. So, the purpose of marriage is to mutually complement one another. It's a purpose. Take note of it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, there is a way I can explain the comparable. But the day I'm going to talk about women, I will talk about that. Marriage has the purpose of not just being mutually complementing each other. Genesis 1 verse 28, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. This is the second reason for marriage. The first is to mutually complement each other. The second is to multiply a godly legacy. Is to multiply a godly legacy. So before you start saying, I want to marry, I want to marry, do you know the purpose of marriage? Are you willing to mutually compliment somebody? Are you ready to multiply a godly legacy? Uh, the third purpose for marriage, for the sake of time, I can give you about 15, is Genesis 1, 26 to 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps, creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Question. Question. What is the third purpose for marriage? Is to mirror God's image. It's a big deal. God created man in his image to be an extension of his kingdom in heaven. So the reason God created mankind is to make this place his annex. So when we want to marry, one of the reasons is God wants humanity to reflect his image. So the purpose of marriage is also to mirror God's image. We are to photocopy God. We are not the original. So the question is this. The person you are dating, can the person compliment you mutually? Can the person help you produce godly legacies? Can the person help you mirror God's image? They are big deal. Don't sweep them beneath the carpet. If not, there will be no hope for your future. No hope for your family. No hope for your children. No hope for your relationship. It's a big deal. Nobody should let you think marriage is reduced to wedding. It's not wedding. Our subject this evening, faulty family foundation. All these are conditioned precedent to marriage. Before you decide, whom shall I then marry? I've not even done one third yet of this whole thing. Look at this again. Genesis chapter 1. No, Genesis chapter 2, forgive me. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, 
and they shall be one flesh. In this, this is a key foundation for marriage. In the text, the first thing you need to know is immediately you marry, the new relationship is the priority, not your mother, not your father. My mother was my girlfriend when I married. I, my mother called me Sherry. Sherry means my sweetheart, my darling. My sisters know my mother loves me. Ah, me, I am mama's boy. My mother loves me. When I was in school, they said, I have a big head. My mother said, don't mind them. Your head is the finest in the whole world. <laughs> that is mommy's boy. Sometimes I think my daddy used to get jealous. My mother loves me. Even till date, my mother, when I am sick, you think I have no wife. My mother loves me. My sisters, they are watching. They know mama loves me. But when I married Samuela, sadly, I relegated my mother to the second floor. It was not easy. It can be emotionally torturing. Wait until you become a parent to understand. Because you believe nobody can take care of your child better than yourself. But according to God's other things, it gets to a place where it says, a man must leave his father and his mother. In other words, in the living, it means that all lesser relationship must give way to the newly formed marital relationship. Any man who makes the father, the mother, much a priority than you, the wife, he has a problem of lack of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. You must become the first. All human relationship, your marriage, must become the first. It's tough, but this is the reality. Number two, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. In other words, marriage is permanent. The Greek Hebrew word used there is dabak, which suggests the idea when you marry, you are permanently glued or joined together rather than temporarily taped marriage. Cleaving involves unwavering loyalty to one's marital partner no flirting no sex with another cleave not temporarily taped therefore shall a man leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh marriage is permanent ladies and gentlemen let me say it again marriage is permanent marriage is permanent when they become one flesh it deals with the deep concept of intimacy. What are the conditions and terms of marriage? You see, when the Bible says two individuals shall become one flesh, the meaning is accept and use your differences as complementary. You must agree. My wife is very slow in taking decisions. I take decisions like, like a laser. A list of liar. I take it. When I want to go and buy this phone tomorrow, tonight, I'll go online. I'll check the brand. I'll check the color. I'll check the space. I will check four places where it is currently available. When I spark the car, I start. I know I have enough money. I know I know the brand. So if I don't get the black or the color I'm looking for, I know first, second, third options before I go. I will not waste 10 minutes there. But when I go with Samuela, my goodness, when she sees that one, God's will, just come and watch and I will go. First, I used to get angry, but they said I was not sexy. Then I've stopped. So when she says, let's go somewhere, the whole day is for her. So when we go, she sees a butterfly. Whoa! Then I will also respond. Whoa! Now everybody says, now I am becoming sexy. Ha! <sighs> But you see, if I take every decision like less a lie, sometimes I get burned very hard. So sometimes a wisdom is better. I get angry, she should be quiet. My wife doesn't get angry much, no. But she's stubborn. It's very difficult. But she's very calm outside. But she will deal with you in the room. Nobody will know. And she will never shout. She's always calm. Accept and use your differences as complementary. One flesh involves 
learning to accept the differences as complementary. The, 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 the oneness and, th and, 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 and thinking, acting and feeling as one functional unit is also the meaning when they say they become one flesh. So you're thinking, you have individual personalities, but as a family, as a unit, because of the oneness, you see that you need to agree at a certain level. Sometimes you disagree to agree. You, your feelings, your functionality must come as one unit. It's not easy. It takes time. But that is God's ideal. Marriage involves deep sexual intimacy. All the sex you are craving for, all the kind of sexual styles you are craving for, you are going to get tired with it. Just save yourself. But anybody who is not ready for sex, don't be married. The only thing my sisters cannot do for me is I can't sleep with them. They can cook for me. They can help me do anything. They can give me a lot of companionship. But guess what? This one, my mother cannot provide. My sisters cannot provide. One of the customized benefits of marriage is good sex. Good sex. Good sex. And the church doesn't talk about it. People just go and they behave anyhow and call it sex. Hmm? Hmm? How? Marriage involves sex. S-E-X. Sex. If you are not ready to be sex, don't marry. If you are not ready to sex, don't marry. It's terms and conditions of marriage. One of them is Sex. Somebody says sex. I didn't hear you. Somebody says sex. Look at you people. If you have indeed been having sex within the context of marriage, sex is beautiful. Somebody says sex. Ah, bad people. Look at it very carefully. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, a man a woman, I submit tonight, marriage is monogamous and it is heterosexual. The foolishness of lesbianism, the foolishness of homosexuality is not according to God's ideal. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one. Ladies and gentlemen, marriage is heterosexual. It's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. It is Eve and Adam, not Eve and Eva. It's one man, one woman. It is monogamous. It's not polygamous. It's not polyandry. One man, one woman. Our subject, faulty family foundation, subheading, whom? Shall I marry? I don't have time. Look at the text again. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Now I am presenting now. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. Focus. In chapter 2, verse 18, God will give Adam a wife. But before Adam had a wife, one thing you need to know, question one, who placed Adam in the garden according to the text? Who placed Adam in the garden? No, look at the text. Who placed, pay attention to details. Who placed Adam in the garden? Lord God. Not just Lord, not just God. Lord God. If the Bible wants to use just Lord, it will have used Lord. So Lord God placed Adam in the garden. Question number two, what was Adam's purpose in the garden based on the text? Is to do all, to tend it and to what? Keep it. Announcement number one. Adam was clear from his creator, his purpose of existence before God got him a wife. Let me say it differently. Without knowing your purpose of existence, you must not attempt to get a spouse. On what basis are you getting a spouse? Your purpose is your lifelong assignment. 
The reason God brought you on earth, if your spouse, you are a woman, your husband is to help you, is to partner you as a suitable helpmate to fulfill your lifelong assignment. You need to do this. We call it in legal terms, it's a condition precedent before the contract or the agreement. The next time a young man proposed to a young lady, give him 30 seconds. One, two, three. Say, tell me your purpose. One, two, three, four. 30 seconds. If he can't, suck it. On a lighter note, young men, we must get our purpose clear before we marry. Do you know what will happen? If through life you discover your purpose, you will notice you have married the wrong person. And guess what? There is nothing you can do. Save yourself the heartache. It's biblical. Anything aside this is a faulty family foundation. Today I'm gentle. It will save you a lot of heartache. A lot of pain. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made. Indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Watch. Number two. If you find a good wife or a good husband, what have you found? Favor. From who? The Lord. In other words, marriage was birth only after God noticed that the needful things for the harmonious living of our planet was in place. Marriage did not come. I said it yesterday on the first day. On the second day, it came on the sixth day. So when marriage came, God concluded everything he has made, it was excellent. It was perfect. Allow me to make this point. And this is going to cause a little controversy, but it is in keeping with the Bible, deep Bible, including the writings of Ellen White, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the side and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil paused. How many trees were in the garden, according to the text? The one on the screen, watch it. How many trees? Think. Those online, you can type. How many trees were in the garden? Based on Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 9. In this context, how many trees are we looking at? Talk to me. How many? Come again. Every. No, I want the number. How many? Three. How many? All right. And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the eye. So tree number one, the tree must be pleasant to the eye. Tree number two, trees good for food. They are categories. Tree number three, the tree of life. Tree number four, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In these are four conditions every man must meet before you pick somebody's daughter. Anything aside this will make marriage a suicide and not suitable. Number one, you must have the capacity to have a clean environment. Trees pleasant to the eye. Your room must be clean. Your environment must be clean. I'm not saying luxury. It must be clean. If it is a single room, it must be clean. If it is a chamber and hall, it must be clean. Whatever it is, your room must be clean. Your environment, when somebody enters your place, they need to see trees that are pleasant to the eye. Tree number two, tree good for food. Everybody attempting to marry must have capacity to provide a balanced diet. Don't marry and you cannot get food to eat. It is abnormal. At least be able to provide food. That is not just food, but it is good to be called food. In today's language, it must be a balanced diet. It means you must be working. We can't marry and beg for food. 
This is the reason young men must work hard and smart. I'm not saying luxury. Sometimes the young women, the expectations is so high. If you are even in a single room, be clean. Number two, have capacity to feed yourself and your would-be spouse. Is the minimum you can do. Ladies, don't expect anything less than this. Don't. 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 A man must have capacity to keep his environment clean and must be able to provide food. It's a basic requirement. Number three, the tree of life in the midst of the garden. The couples must be preparing to take care of health. Health care. When you are sick, you are married tomorrow. You are sick. There are some sicknesses. The funds are beyond a young man getting married. When I was 26 years, I got married. My wife was 24 years. We got married. We were not rich. We had no money. But at least I had a room. I was able to provide good food. And if she was sick, I can take her to the hospital. I was prepared at least to a certain point. Point number four. Three of knowledge of good and evil. Capacity to know the difference between right and wrong. It's a moral standing. The tree of good and evil, you need to know your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend must know the difference between right and wrong. In Adventist parlance, we call it a conceptual understanding of the great controversy. You need to know what is right, what is wrong. Proverbs 18, verse 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the law. All this we are saying in search of a good or a right spouse it's not by merit but it is by grace no amount of intelligence no amount of smartness no amount of focus because we don't know tomorrow i can be right today but god knows my real character disposition so he can tell this guy is good for this lady he knows tomorrow he knows how he will change he knows how he react in 30 years, in 20 years, when he has access to power, wealth, opportunity. So the reason the Bible says, if you find a good wife, a good husband, God has guided you. You have what we call favor. Somebody say, may God locate me with favor. You can decide not to say it. Somebody say, you are not married. May God locate me with this favor. Yes, you need it to find a good spouse. Our subject this evening, faulty family foundations. If I were to have time, I would have dealt with the modern trend of dating, the historical antecedent, the language and the culture pattern we have today. Today's dating culture teaches young men and women. If he's not good for you, leave him and go for somebody else. If he's not good for you, leave him and go for somebody else. So our daughters have grown. All they know is that when you are dating and there is a problem, the solution is what? Leave and go for some else. Leave and go for some else. Leave and go for some else. And over a period of time, when they are married, the first solution to any crisis is what? Leave and get somebody else. Same applies to our sons, our brothers. I'm not here by saying any abusive relationship must be kept. I'm speaking in context. Get me right. Get me well. All right, for the sake of time. Watch, this was the scripture text we read. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 18 to verse 19. There are three things that are too amazing for me, Agat says. The fourth, I do not understand. Which is the first one? The way of an eagle in the sky. The second, the way of a snake on a rock. The third, the way of a sheep on the high sea. The fourth, the way of a man with a lady or a maiden. So three things, they are amazing. 
The Bible says the fourth you can't comprehend. Which is the fourth? When you see a man and a woman intimate, you can't understand. There is a little mystery. This is the reason why before you take a marital vow, know what you are doing. I got married in 2010. Our premarital photo is that. I have been a nice boy from day one. You can't contest it. My mother told me. This was the vow I took. I. God will need to echo Kojo Mensa. Do take thee, Henry Samuel Avandi, to be my lawful wedded wife. And I do promise and covenant before God and these witnesses to live together with thee after God's own ordinance in the holy state of matrimony to have thee Hold thee, love thee, and honor thee. I do solemnly promise before God to be thy faithful, loving and faithful husband, to be true and loyal to thee in every condition of life, in prosperity and adversity, in sickness and in health. I do promise to keep myself unto thee and unto thee only until death do us part. All these I faithfully promise, my heavenly Father, been my helper d whenever i go to weddings like you had one here on sunday pastor am i correct and they are saying this and young people are laughing they don't know the details watch the bow number one covenant covenant before who god you are covenanting that this marriage will be contracted after whose ordinance? God's own ordinance. In other words, the Bible is going to be the framework of the marriage. You are saying it's a holy matrimony. The relationship is a holy covenant. It's not secular. It's not driven by Hollywood. Driven by Hollywood. Gollywood. Nollywood. No. Driven by the Holy Spirit and by God. You say you promise before God to be loving, to be faithful, and to be true, and to be loyal. Where? In every condition of life. In other words, I will say there should be no day I will leave this girl for life. It's for life. Marriage is deep. You can't make this covenant with any snake wearing the Maasai cloth. It's deep. It's deep. And you need to do it intelligently with holy fear and trembling. You are covenanting before who? God. And you are saying, when we make the marital vow, we say, I want to struggle by the grace of God to keep this vow until death do us part. Question. How can such a covenant, the condition preceding this covenant, be taken whimsically, carelessly, recklessly? And it's as if rat and rabbit are running. It's a game. I need to con her. I need to win her. It's like, it's like a joke. Marriage is not a joke. It's a serious business. Eternity is at stake. If you watch marriage very carefully, God is the active participant in every Christian marriage. But with the secularization of marriage, it is no longer seen as divine institution, but rather as a social contract. This is the root cause of all marital woes. The holiness is taken away. Even marriage services. People are only excited about, can you kiss the bride? There is a lot of life after that. The next 40 years, 60 years, 70 years are ahead of them. Mortals making a promise before God. To be faithful, you need to be praying for married couples. You need to be praying for people who want to date. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason 
This subject matter, you cannot trust yourself and you cannot take God out of the process. The result with the secularization of marriage, broken hearts and broken homes. How do you avoid the broken heart and the broken home? Genesis chapter 24. Watch the steps. I'm coming to run like a race. You must be smart enough to pick the point for the sake of time. There is no perfect marriage after sin. Every marriage has its difficulty. But Bible in its wisdom, God in his wisdom, recorded one of the finest, one of the finest love stories in the Bible, Genesis chapter 24. Those of you join on Uplift, we've dealt with it extensively. Abraham was now old and well advanced in years. And the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my tie. Concerning the wife of his son, Abraham was interested. I want to submit parents have a great role in the choice of spouses of their children. I'm not saying they determine they have a role to play. Abraham was old and advanced in years. The Lord has blessed him in every way. He's about to exit. He needs to leave a legacy. He called the most trusted servant and said, make a covenant between me and you and God concerning the wife of my son. I repeat, no matter how illiterate your parents are, they have a say. My father died in 2009. I met Samuel in 2008. I came back, I sat with daddy, and I told daddy, I saw a young lady in Sierra Leone when we started dating. I, 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 I love her, daddy. She says, let me see her picture. My father asked me questions upon questions about Samuel. And before he died, he says, he should call me. I came. I don't know her. We married that girl. She's good. I told my mother. I said, Mama, I want you to see the lady. I paid her ticket and brought Samuela to Ghana. She stayed for two months. My sister saw her. My family saw her. My mother gave her verdict. I did not say, my mother is an illiterate. She has nothing to say concerning my marriage. Please, it costs nothing to listen. I repeat, parents, have a great role in the choice of their, the spouses of their children. Don't think they have nothing to say. Wait till you become a father. Wait till you become a mother. You understand. When your child feels you are useless to this subject matter, at least let her state her opinion. Let her tell you some things she has seen through life. Parents have a role to play in the choice of their spouse. Best Number three, I want you to swear by the law, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanite among whom I am living, but you will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my, for my son Isaac. In other words, the lesson there is the choice of spouse cannot be from any spiritual look. You can't pick a wife from every place. No. Abraham says, I live among the Canaanites. I see the way they worship. I see their belief system. Hey, Eliezer, make no mistake. The Canaanite is a no-go area. Go to my people. Go to my people. Go to my country. Go to my relatives. And there you get a wife for my son Isaac. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't marry from every place. You can't marry from every home. You can't marry from every locus. The reason is simple. Your belief systems must align. Don't make a mistake. He is six par. She is fresh. She got the vitals. That will not sustain a marriage. You cannot marry from any spiritual locus. If that is clear, let the unmarried scream and say an amen. Faulty family foundation. Verse 5, the servant asked him, what if the woman 
is unwilling to come back with me to this land, shall I then take your son back to the country you, you came from? Make sure Abraham responded that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me on earth saying to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angels before you that you can get a wife for my son from there. What is the lesson? Choice of a spouse cannot be left. Choice of a spouse cannot be from any spiritual locus. But if you watch it very deeply, you cannot, you cannot commit your search work to any other party apart from God. Look at the way Abraham said it. Abraham said, don't take my child there, but I believe the Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's house, he will send his angels before you, and you get a wife for my son from where we are talking about. The Bible says, the servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling? Abraham was so sure. He was so sure. Don't make a mistake. Go to this place. I'm trusting God. God is able to do it. God is able to find a wife. God is able to find me a husband. God is able to do this. I don't know all the women in the world. I trust God. I trust His. I trust God. Simple terms. Ladies and gentlemen, when you want to get married, don't go and look for a husband and bring to God and say, bless it. Don't take a wife and bring to God. Bless it. Before you even search. Commit your search work. The process of dating. The process of courtship, you need to commit to the God of heaven. This is where we pray the prayer. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Dear Lord, I don't even know what tomorrow holds, but you hold tomorrow. You created me for purpose. You know my being. You knew what you created me to do on earth. I surrender today who I become a husband to who I become a wife to, in the name of Jesus, I don't trust my intelligence, I don't trust my feelings, I don't trust my God. Please, connect me to a man according to your divine similitude. Commit the search to God. Don't start dating him and then you ask God, is he the one? Don't do it. Don't start dating her. And you have crossed lines. Then you are asking the Lord, please, make her the one. No, don't do it. Verse Number eight, if the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hands under the tie of his master, Abraham, and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Imagine, just the choice of a wife. People were making covenant. They were swearing. May God deal with me if I break the rules of engagement. Look at verse 10. So I call this the pre courtship preparation. Parents are involved. Prayer is involved. The low cost is determined. I will not marry an unbeliever. I will not marry this. I am tempted to read a quote concerning don't marry from any spiritual low cost. From the book, Councils for the Church, chapter 19, the, the, the author says, Men and women who are otherwise sensible and consensual close their ears to counsel. They are deaf to the appeals. I'm tempted to read all. Just give me a moment. Sometimes when they tell the young people, don't marry from every local, they think everybody is stupid and they are wise. There is in the Christian world an astonishing, alarming indifference to the teachings of God's word in regard to marriage of Christians with unbelievers. Many who profess to lie and fear God, chose to follow the bent of their own minds rather than the counsel of infinite wisdom in a matter which vitally concerns the happiness and well-being of both parties for this world and the next. Reason, judgment, and the fear of God are set aside and blind impulse, stubborn determinations are allowed to control Men and women who are otherwise sensible and consensual close their ears to counsel. They are deaf 
to the appeals and entreaties of friends and kindred and the servants of God. Pastors will say, elders will say, friends will say, I want him, I want him. Everybody's saying, danger. He's not a believer. She's not a believer. This is the one I want. And my believer, I mean, there are people in your church who sometimes are worse than the believers, uh, unbelievers. But that doesn't mean you go to unbelievers either. The expressions of caution or warning is regarded as impenitent, meddling, and, and the friend who is faithful enough to utter a remonstrance is treated as an enemy. When she's dating that guy, you notice they are heading to disaster, and you are bold, audacious to tell her, my sister, that guy, watch out. She makes you an enemy. Ellen White says, anyone, a friend who is faithful enough to utter a remonstrance is treated as an enemy. All this is as Satan would have it. He weaves his spell about the soul and it becomes bewitched, infatuated. Reason lets fall the ruins of self-control upon the neck of lust. And sanctified passion, best way, until too late, the victim awakens to a life of misery and bondage. This is not a picture drawn by the imagination, but a recital of fact. God's sanctions is not given to unions uh, which he has expressly forbidden. Don't marry from this locality. No, we will. All this is us. Satan will have it. But too often, the unconverted heart follows its own desires and marriages unsanctioned by God are formed. I repeat, and marriages unsanctioned by God are formed because of this many men and women are without hope and without God in the world. Their noble aspirations are there. By a chain of circumstances, they are held in Satan's nest. Those who are ruled by passion and impulse who have a bitter harvest to reap in this life and their cause may result in the lose of their souls. Those who profess the truth trample upon the will of God in marrying unbelievers. They lose his favor and make bitter works for repentance. The unbelieving may possess an excellent moral character. But the fact that he or she has not answered to the claims of God and has neglected so great a salvation is sufficient reason why such a union should not be consummated. He may be a decent guy. He may be a good guy. Your, your belief system, he doesn't believe what you believe. This author says, or the pen of inspiration says, on that ground, no matter how good he is, don't marry him. Don't marry her. You do it to your peril. The character of God, of the unbelieving, may be similar to that of the young man to whom Jesus addressed the words, one thing thou lackest. That was the one thing needful. He may be somebody, courteous, decent, hardworking, or if he doesn't believe the present truth, there is enough reason not to marry him, not to marry her. God is my witness. I fear nobody. I have declared it without hesitation. And generations are going to come even after these sessions that will careless, recklessly, marry, foolishly, without tomorrow, no respect for God. Yet, we don't know tomorrow. We don't know the future. I want to do part two tomorrow. Is there somebody here tonight? Who is single? Who wants to say, Dear Lord, I refuse to trust myself. I want, by the grace of God, anything regarding marriage, anything regarding dating, anything regarding courtship, I want to surrender to God completely. Raise your hand. I am damn serious than any other day. Hands down. You don't get it. Those online, hear me. This presentation it's life divine. Listen. God can tell 
how many years I'll be on this earth. I don't know. He knows tomorrow. He knows your boyfriend, how he will turn in the next 10 years. He knows your girlfriend, what she will become in the next 50 years. So God in his wisdom can see tomorrow. So in his wisdom, today she may be good. But God knowing tomorrow, knowing what he has reserved for you, will say, she appears good now. Men watch from the outside, but God watch from the inside. On this marriage, he said, don't marry without consulting me. One way to consult God before marriage, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Now my topic is completely out of order. Number one is through his word. Through his word. Number two is through prayer. When I was going to get married, fasted one and a half years every Saturday I fasted my daddy told me if you get it wrong son you are doomed greatness is destined for you but if you get it wrong you are doomed my father will pray for me and he will cry he said dear Lord spare him spare him the long journey through life with the wrong wife Grant my son favor. Direct his path. I call on heavens to command the daughters of Zion. May the one meant for God's will, may their path cross. This evening, if you want to say tonight, for the rest of my life until I'm married, we want to do it God's way. I want to invoke God heavily. I will not trust in my heart and in my own understanding. I want to acknowledge God and anything he says concerning marriage, I want to pursue it. I don't want to make a mistake. I want God to guide me. I ask again, raise your hands. Those watching online, just tie. I surrender with the greatest of respect for the singles who desire this. I want you to come. Don't be ashamed of the cameras. It's not because I have nothing to say. I ask you to come to the altar. It is your privilege. Come. I have made a decision that I, ah, by the grace of God, my relationship and marital issue, I want God. I want to surrender it to God tonight. I want to pray a prayer I have never prayed in a long time this night. Please kneel down here. When you come, kneel down. Kneel down in awe. Those watching online. If you are online, you are watching, and you are in a state you need help concerning your relationship, your marriage, your dating and courtship, you want God to intervene, you want us to pray with you. They are dropping the prayer link, you want to look at it again. When you come, just go on your knees. Please, can we sing the song, It Is Well, It Is Well, just the first answer. And I want the musicians with the best voice to sing it very calmly, nicely. Only the first stanza, it is well. There is hope for young people who are not yet married. There is hope for them. On your knees, sing it. This is a very important season this night. When peace like a river. Parents, join as we sing this song, I'm going to pray for them. When peace like a river, like a river attends my way. my way. I have struggled with relationship for too long. Lord, put 
ever. Thou hast taught me to say, We sing the first and there again when peace like a river. Like sea below stroke. Whatever, whatever. of you in the auditorium can be upstanding it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul just a minute before we sing the refrain again Hear me. How can you commit your relationship to God that you have no relationship? I can't get. Satan is so wicked. How can you commit your relationship? God guide me. To have a relationship with a man. Guide me to have a relationship with a woman. But I don't need a relationship with you. Before I pray. Anybody watching on anybody here. I am speaking from a deep place of spiritual insight. You don't have a relationship with Christ. As a spectre. I want to say today, I can ask God to give me a relationship with a woman whilst I have no relationship with him. I cannot have a relationship with a man asking God, guide me, but I have no relationship with this God. The way I'm living my life, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want to be baptized. I first want a relationship with heaven. Then I can confidently say like Abraham, the God of heaven who brought me out of my father's house, out of my nation and my kindred, he will send his angels over and you get a spout for my son. Is there somebody who have no relationship with this God? Please forget the cameras. Or get the camera. You don't have a relationship with God. You want to say, dear Lord, today. Let today be my turnaround. It's a Wednesday. It's the 21st of February. I want God to help me. I want to give my love to Jesus. I want to be either baptized or rebaptized. God's will, the way I've lived my life, I'm not a Christian. I know everybody can listen. I know I want to have a relationship with this God. You want to sing the refrain again? No, the first answer, it is well. As we are singing it one minute, those of you online, if you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you or have spoken to you, you want to give your life to Jesus and you want to be baptized, just indicate, I am in. 
I am in. And we are going to reach out to you. The online group, you take over that. Those online, I repeat, as we sing this again, I know I want to give my life to Jesus and be baptized or rebaptized. I want a relationship with him first before a boyfriend or girlfriend. True relationship. I want to love God completely. As we sing this song, make that commitment. It is well. And those of you here, just raise up your hand. If you want to give your life to Jesus in this auditorium, my heart is aching. My heart is aching. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be baptized. Those of you, you that you are married or whatever it is, just I want to give my life to Jesus. Just raise up your hand wherever you are. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be baptized. I want to follow God completely. Just raise up your hand. Anybody, just lift up your hand. Either I want to be baptized or rebaptized. Just lift up your hand. It is well. With my soul. All heads bow, all eyes closed. I want to give my life to Jesus first. I want him to be Lord over my life. It is well. It is well. We'll sing the refrain again for the last time. It is well with my soul. All heads bow, all eyes closed. We want to pray this evening. Is there anybody who wants to give his life to Jesus before he helps me get a husband or a wife? I want him to be my husband. I want him to be my spouse. Just indicate online, I am in. And those of you here, just lift up your hand. And I want to pray. The organ is becoming that song very quietly. All heads bow, all eyes closed. Spend the next first minute, just whisper a prayer to God. As they hum the refrain for us, it is well. Those of you standing, just whisper a prayer. Any young man you know, any young woman you know, battling to find a spouse, battling to find a relationship, first ask God, may he first make you his husband, make you the spouse, before God will search for a spouse for him or her. The organ is to be humming that song for us very quietly as we pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as the organist is humming that chorus that it is well, tonight we pray in the name of Jesus for every son of God and every daughter of God under the sound of your voice. Satan is wicked. Satan is very diabolic. He wants to mislead. He wants to misdirect and misguide. So that our sons, our daughters, our brothers, our sisters, our cousins and nephews, our grandchildren, 
will be connected with the wrong people tonight in a relationship that is on a trajectory that will lead to death and hell in this place of prayer we pray for all these ones on the altar and those joining online we pray in the name of Jesus may all illegal all heaven rejected relationships that are currently in existence Lord do us a favor may they be broken any boyfriend attached to any girlfriend and God in your wisdom it will not end up well we pray tonight may such relationship not end in marriage may they be broken in the name of Jesus we pray for our daughters and our sons and brothers any individual or individuals who are meant to be joined together and they do not know themselves they are even unaware they may be in the same town they may be in the same church like in place and they even do not know in the books of heaven they were destined to be married we pray today open eyes let path begin to cross rewire emotions and attachments and affections please may none in this place be married to somebody heavens have no sanction today we pray some of us our families is a generational pattern we are always married to the wrong people our grandparents married the wrong people our fathers and mothers married the wrong people and it is our turn we are at the verge of marrying the wrong people so tonight any generational pattern any generational curse that is in this dimension and in this area that will cause pain and tears we pray that may they be rejected may they be annulled may they be cancelled may they be abrogated any womb carrying atrocity any womb carrying wrong marital connections may they be aborted and experience a miscarriage in the name of Jesus we pray today join sons that must be joined to daughters join daughters that must be joined to son we pray today let there be deliverance deal with some of the issues wrong partners from the roots may the forebearers who made errors may it not be the portion of this generation let the cure be secured in jesus even today lastly i pray for my brothers and i pray for my sisters i pray for those joining online if any of them indeed lord is battling and i believe to surrender completely begin to live a life of purity a life of honesty a life of christian decency within the context of dating or courtship that will be pleasing to heaven may you send forth help anybody here that must be redeemed through accepting Jesus again or for the first time as their Lord and personal Savior or at best recommit again to the Lord may it happen between today Thursday Friday and Saturday hold Satan at bay on this matter so until again we meet tomorrow may the Lord bless you may the Lord keep you may the God of heaven lift up his fame upon the young people of this church in a very special way may God show you favor may God show you kindness in this very difficult phase of your life may you triumph and so shall it be 
in Jesus name Amen. somebody say an amen God bless you when we are close I want to meet all of you here briefly tomorrow you can be seated tomorrow as they sit down chances are we may present the part two of this session as the Lord will direct please the same time the same place the same tomorrow morning 8 a.m we have a special prayer east african time you may want to join the communication team will share with you the details and the link stay blessed see you tomorrow bye bye